Welcome. You know, I see faces, I see a lot of faces I've seen for several semesters, several years. I'm just grateful for each one of you that come out every Friday morning to enjoy our time together. And let me tell you something, this morning is a very special morning. You're gonna be very glad that you're here. We have a, someone, I always, I always say every time, oh, we've got a great, I know I'm kind of that way, you know, it's like every speaker is a fan, oh, here we go. There we go. Did you notice I'm tall? I'm tall, that creates problems. Can you hear me? There you go. Uh, you know, every week I say, we got this great speaker, you don't want to miss it and all that. Well, this week, I'm not lying. <laughs> we got someone that's outstanding, and I just want to introduce Mr. William Steiner to you. Mr. William Steiner is very distinguished. He is um, the founder of something that I've actually had a little part in, the Orangewood um, all of a sudden my mind goes blank of your children's home, thank you. <laughs> anyway, uh, let me, let me I, Mr. Stern asked me not to go through, read this whole, you have it in your hand, but I want to go through some of his highlights of who this man is who's coming to speak with us on o the bankruptcy in o Orange County. But um, uh, he, uh, Mr. Steiner is the um, founding director of the Orangewood Children's Home and deputy director of children's services in Orange County. His career also included employment with the California Youth Authority, the Los Angeles County Department of Adoptions, Metropolitan State Hospital, and a, and a variety of residential treatment agencies serving abused and neglected children. From 99 to 2003, he was a National Program Director for Child Help USA and the Project Director for the Merv Griffin Village of Arizona. Um, he's been a politician. <laughs> he laughs when he, okay, regarding, regarding his political involvement, Mr. Steiner was first elected as a school board member for the Orange County Unified School District in 83. He was reelected re in 1987, served as a city councilman in Orange until 1993. Um, he uh, was on the board of the uh, Orange County Transportation Authority, the OC Sanitation District, Cal Optima, the Fire Authority and the Transportation Corridor Agency. He served as chairman of the City of Orange Planning Commission, and he's past president of the Rotary Club of Orange. Governor George Dukemijan uh, appointed Mr. Steiner of the, to the State Child uh, Development Program's Advisory Committee in 86, and from 90 to 98, he served as a policy advisor to the Cabinet Secretary for Child Development and Education and administration of Governor Pete w Wilson. <coughs> He's nationally recognized expert on child abuse and neglect. I just think that's, a, that's an amazing, wonderful thing. Uh, Mr. Steiner served as a delegate from the United States to Poland, the Czech Republic, and the former Soviet Union in 1991, reviewing the extent of child abuse and neglect and the effect of democratization and rapid political, economic, and social change on children and families. Um, since 1997, he has been involved in business and cultural exchanges with the People's Republic of China. He's received a number of awards, Child Advocate of the Year by the California Court Appointed Special Advocates and Citizen of the Year for the City of Orange. Um, in 92, he was named Outstanding Elected Official, wow, by the Orange County Chapter of the American Society of Public Administrators. Can I keep going? No. Okay. <laughs> Let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Steiner. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, 90 minutes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so relieved you used 10 minutes up of the 90 minutes I'm supposed to talk. <laughs> wow. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. Um, I was pretty intimidated by this. You know, I'm, I don't, I talk to college students for maybe 40 minutes or so. As a politician, you don't want to talk a long time because you then talk people out of voting for you. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm supposed to be doing 90 minutes. So, um, but then I start meeting some people here that I know. Uh, Rick Strickland, I knew from the probation department. Tom Cole, I knew. Uh, Detective Marty Geller, I mean, couldn't believe it in the sheriff's department. He brought in 15 kids to me from, I think, Laguna Niguel, or Mission Viejo, um, on a Friday afternoon. Fifteen kids. 
terrible case. And, and they're here. So some of these folks kind of know where the bodies are buried. And, uh, but, uh, and then I, I'm so happy to see some mature, older people that have paid their dues in the community and not a bunch of millennial college students. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, let me sort of get into this and talk about municipal bankruptcies. I don't know whether that's the most interesting thing to be asked to talk about, but they do, they have been very rare and um, and they probably today remain the option of last resort for struggling towns, cities, and counties. Um, there's been 624 municipal bankruptcies in the United States since 1937. Now, that may, that may sound, well, it's not that rare. It is. California has 459 cities. So since 1937, to have these municipal bankruptcies, um, was really a, a rare occurrence. And then all of a sudden, Orange County in 1994 has the biggest bankruptcy in the history of the country. And uh, we, we, since then, we've had other bankruptcies that you've read about in the newspapers. Uh, Vallejo uh, filed for bankruptcy in 2008, and they didn't address deep city personnel costs and sliding revenue from a housing slump and so they were in bankruptcy till 2011. The smallest city in the United States to file for bankruptcy was in the smallest state in Rhode Island. And they failed to win concessions from their public sector retirees and others um, um, to, to sort of address an $80 million unfunded pension and retiree health benefit problem which was nearly quadruple their $17 million city budget. Then we know San Bernardino filed and Stockton filed and so forth. But since 1994, when Orange County was the largest bankruptcy in the United States, there has been, now it's third, now it's third, because Jefferson County, Alabama in 2011 had a bond debt crisis of $3.14 billion. And it was all because they refinanced their sewer system with auction rate bonds and something called swaps. And interest on the deal spiraled when bond insurers downgraded the county's debt. So they took the place of Orange County as the next biggest. And then in 2013, Detroit took the prize with an $18.5 billion municipal bankruptcy. You know, the population in Detroit uh, from 1950, it declined from 1.8 million people uh, to about 700,000 in July of 2013. And so we know the problems that Detroit faced at that time. And even though the state legislature and the governor intervened, Creditors and insurers were expected to absorb losses of about $7 billion, and creditors got between 14 cents and 75 cents on the dollar. But I'm, that's sort of a history of municipal bankruptcies, but I'm here to talk about the Orange County bankruptcy. How could that happen in 1994 in one of the wealthiest counties in the United States, population bigger than 22 states, the sixth largest county in America in 1994, a budget of over $3 billion, 18,000 employees in 24 different departments, uh, impacting every area of county government and nearly 3 million residents. I did have in my notes to ask the audience, because I would really like to know my audience, how many of you remember the Orange County bankruptcy? Just put your hands up. Look at this. Wow, does that make it a little easier for me? It really does. Uh, were any of you personally affected or worked for counties, 
cities, special districts, water districts, the Orange County Transportation Authority, put your hand up if you were personally affected. A smattering of hands. You know what I'm talking about. Did, do you remember if any of you had your taxes increased to pay for that disaster? Well, let me tell you, a lot of fees were increased. Did any of you personally know central figures in this mess? Well, I know three that are here because, uh, because they know me. And, and, I, I'm, and I was so glad to see them. Rick Strickland from the probation department, Tom Cole, Fred Geller, who was a detective in the sheriff's department, um, who I haven't seen for 30 years. And so they're here. So, uh, but I was certainly involved in this. So I wanna, I wanna share with you during this time um, my viewpoint, uh, who was caught up in all of this, reluctantly caught, uh, caught up into it. So why am I here? Why me as your speaker? Um, I'm really an old guy, I'll be 83 in April, and to be asked to speak to a distinguished series uh, as a lecturer is uh, pretty prestigious. I, I really um, have talked to a lot of people in my life, but not in a, a venue this nice. And, you know, to be hooked up to a sound system that works, um, and to have um, my PowerPoint stuff and my slides managed by Dan, who's going to make sure that it all works correctly. I was going to bring a grandchild with me. <clears throat> There's nothing like spending $800,000 to spiff up the sound system at the Orange City Hall, and then it doesn't work. And the mayor's very embarrassed. So, so uh, but I'm here because, frankly, most of the central figures are, in the Orange County bankruptcy are dead. I mean, that's true. It's absolutely true. And others were so traumatized with the impact of this event on their careers that they don't want any reminders and they've moved on. And um, I don't have anything to lose by sharing my perspectives with you, uh, the good, the bad, the juicy insider information, <laughs> the lessons that were learned, or how inconsistent with the image of Orange County that something so embarrassing could happen. So here I am for you, for better or worse. Um, but I want to reassure you, because according to my children, they tell me that I still have my marbles, okay? <laughs> and a good memory. And I'm a recovering politician <laughs> who hasn't been elected to anything in 20 years, okay? But what I want to do is that per the perspective that I want to share with you to kind of set this up is how I was framed in growing up in a family in a small little town in Iowa of about 2,000 people with parents who were very young. My mother was 19 when I was born in a time when the country was emerging from the Great Depression. Um, I had a sister when I was three who died a few days after her birth. A new sister was adopted from Sioux City, Iowa I immediately got asthma, probably because I had competition from this beautiful little baby girl. <laughs> but seriously, I was surrounded by grandparents and an extended family. Life was pretty predictable and pretty simple. But then World War II disrupted everything. I remember going as a small boy to the train station in this little town, waving flags, hearing the band playing, and watching our boys, very young boys, off who were in the Iowa National Guard to North Africa, where they were captured and spent the rest of the war in a German POW camp. My own family fragmented. Our dad went to work in the steel industry in California. My mother took my little sister 
to her parents' home in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, so she could get a job. And I was left with grandparents in this little town in Iowa. Years later, when I was taking psychology classes, when I was getting my master's, I confronted my mother. How could you abandon me at such a young age? Her answer, well, you were in kindergarten. I mean, we all got back together eventually. So what's the problem? Well, yes, we did get back together, but in Bell, California. Now, that's when I first had to use the word BC. As a believer, it was before Christ. But in Bell, I had to say, yes, I lived in Bell, uh, BC, before corruption. <laughs> because some of you may remember that Robert Rezzo, the city manager, got in big trouble. So did the council. They ripped off this little town of 17,000 people. And then I went to UC Berkeley. And I had to say that I went to UC Berkeley from 1955 to 1959 BC, before chaos. <laughs> no free speech movement. There was a few bohemians down on Telegraph Avenue. The only drug that I used was no dose, seriously, to stay up and study, because I always waited till the last minute. I wore my Air Force uniform around the campus proudly during those years because I was in the ROTC program. And then, of course, we went to the Rose Bowl in January of 1960, although Iowa beat us 38 to 12. And it didn't cost anything to go to UC Berkeley. It was quite a wonderful time. So I married, had five kids, moved to Orange in 1968, how can anything go wrong in Orange? You been in Orange? I had a great job, and then we had the bankruptcy. Wow. So, Dan, can we show slide seven on the direct losses of this bankruptcy? Got it? Oh, wow, look at that technology. Wow, <laughs> look, look at those figures. I mean, get, unbelievable. Uh, $865 million in the cities and the schools and the, lost, gone, gone, okay? And the county government and the public structure and so on and so forth. And so, uh, what in the world was my involvement at this time? In March of 1993, I was appointed as the county supervisor for the fourth supervisor district in Orange County. My cities were Orange, Anaheim, Placentia, Buena Park, and La Palma, and I represented 600,000 residents. I took the place of Supervisor Don Roth, a former mayor of Anaheim. Governor Pete Wilson appointed me to complete the final 20 months of his term. I then ran for my own four-year term in 1994. I won and I was sworn a month after the bankruptcy was declared. I really should have asked for a recount. <laughs> what timing? I was 55 years old, and I had absolutely no background in municipal finance. I was relatively clueless. But, you know, I hadn't just fallen off a turnip truck, and I had a few things going for me to handle these responsibilities of this bankruptcy. One was so I had some political experience. As in, said in my introduction, I was elected to the Orange Unified School District Board twice and I served as a school board president. My wife suggested that I run for the school board because we had five kids in the public schools and we were very involved parents. I conducted a campaign, spent $6,000, attended coffees, made some signs that curled in the dew during the night. I had to restaple them. <laughs> and I got my Indian guide dads to help me with this campaign, and I won. And I wondered, how didn't I get several thousand votes from people, most who I didn't really actually know? I was 47 years old. I'd never run for anything in my life like that. But it helped that the teachers liked my kids. They really did. 
and the teachers supported my election. My political journey had begun. And that was some insulation over what in the world I had to deal with as this brand new supervisor with this Orange County bankruptcy. It was fun to hand out diplomas. It was fun to visit schools. Um, it was nice to be introduced at community events as the Honorable William G. Steiner and so forth. But then I learned the implications of being a school board member in Orange. I learned about declining enrollment, fewer kids. I learned about closing neighborhood schools. And then I realized, well, wait a minute, Sacramento's controlling our budget. They really, how much money we're getting. And um, with that, with a lack of revenue, we weren't able to give our teachers a raise that year. So I learned about petitions for recalls in front of Target. And my wife came up and said, you won't believe it. They're getting signatures to throw you out in front of Target. And I says, what'd you do? She says, I got into a big argument. I says, for God's sake, Nancy, don't hit somebody over the head with that clipboard or it's going to make it worse for me. Then I'm in Florida on a trip on business. I call home, hi, how's it going? Well, we're being picketed. Picketed. Now, these are teachers that liked my kids, but you know, and we only had six houses on our cul-de-sac. What are you doing, Nancy? I'm serving them Pepsi and chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> God. Then I go to a school board meeting, and there's a big bunch of teachers that file into the school board when you were sitting up there. And when they're, they're coming in with balloons, black balloons, and they're coming in, they're juggling tennis balls. And I went, what the hell is that all about? What's that mean? In fact, it was so disruptive that we had to adjourn and go back into a, a, off, a, a meeting area in the back and to let things settle down. And the orange police officer was in there and I said, what's the deal with these tennis balls? Well, we hear they're going to throw them at you. <laughs> he says, you've got to be kidding. And all of a sudden, the school board president looked kind of sheepish. And he said, well, I probably caused a problem because I told the union leaders you don't have the balls to strike. <laughs> so it wasn't so much fun being a school board member, um, but I survived, I was wiser. Another election I won again, I spent $11,000 that time. Then I was elected to the Orange City Council, as was told in my introduction. Uh, and I was mayor pro tem, and I was, uh, I spent $53,000 for that, so that wasn't just Indian Guide Dads, it helped fund that. And then I had a real humbling experience in 1991. I ran for election for the California Assembly. I spent $275,000, and I lost. Still, with all those experiences, I became more politically astute. And I also had some professional successes in my field of expertise, which I think helped me with the bankruptcy problem. As was indicated, I was appointed director of the Albert Sitton Home in 1978. It was Orange County's emergency shelter for abused and neglected children. So I was a county employee for eight years and was totally consumed with the whole Orangewood stuff to build the shelter. And then was deputy director of the social service agency, 3,500 employees, and more on that later. But that, that helped me in terms of maturing, in terms of trying to see what in the world we do about this mess. So uh, as a member of the Board of Supervisors, I may not have had expertise in the area of county investments, but I wasn't clueless or naive in terms of political intuition or community organization, or administrative responsibilities. Still, I'm not making excuses, excuses or dodging any of my own failings in this bankruptcy. But let me give you further context. Why this bankruptcy hit me so hard? 
did receive my bachelor's from UC Berkeley in criminology. I was going to be a deputy probation officer. I worked in the field of adoptions and placed some babies for adoption in Long Beach. Then I worked with youthful offenders in Norwalk for the California Youth Authority. They convinced me to go to USC and get my master's in social work, which I did. So prior to going to Orange County to be this director of the Albert Sitton Home, I worked for 11 years um, in a nonprofit program, faith-based program that I established when I was 29 years old in Riverside. And it became a big statewide agency for troubled kids. We had contracts with 17 counties. And although I was uh, in Covenant Presbyterian Church in Orange at the time, I knew I should go to the Lutherans to pull this all off. So I got on a plane, and I went to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and I met with the Evangelical Lutheran Good Samaritan Society, who had 200 retirement homes throughout the Midwest. And I said, we got this really big need in California. Would you consider sponsoring us? And they did. Unbelievable. And so I was there for 11 years, and I met a couple probation officers in Orange County who said, why don't you apply for the job of Albert Sitton Home? Oh, the board will never pick an outsider. Oh, but I did, and I got the job. And so um, that was a great job, but within two years, we were exper- by 1980, we were experiencing overcrowding with kids sleeping on mattresses on the floor and running out of hot water at bedtime and bringing in extra cribs for babies and admitting as much as 100 children a month is like an emergency room. And Prop 13 had passed three months after I came to the county. Great timing, which you'll hear about my other timing, too. Um, And so um, we thought, is there any chance, since the county wasn't going to be able to do much for us, could we do a public-private partnership and build a new emergency shelter for Orange County called Orangewood Children's Home. And that involved going out and raising $8.5 million. And we did it. We did it. Um, We had a tremendous, uh, the timing was right for it. We were on a roll. Uh, It was absolutely the best job I could have ever had in my life. There was lots of teamwork. The county people pulled together, the agencies, the cities did, um, all the cities. Um, I went to Anaheim. I said, Anaheim, you give me 17% of my kids. I'd like $224,000 towards this goal of $8.5 million. The city manager says, you've got to be kidding. I says, no, I'm serious. You need to be part of this solution. Help us build a new children's shelter. No, we, we got too many other things to do in Anaheim. Well, you know, when you know some, just the right people around the county, and you can get them to go talk to the mayor, we got the money, okay? We got the money, okay? So it was a big winner countywide. Lots of positive publicity in the Register and the Washington Times, and on Channel 2 with Dave Lopez, and Channel 4 with Vicki Vargas especially, Okay? And lots of awards. We really took good care of kids. We were seen as a model for the state. There was all this leadership from the business community. We had celebrities involved, political leaders. I gave tours and tours and tours. We raised a lot of money, and we opened that children's home in October of 1985. Now, there was a side benefit personally for me. You heard in my introduction that I started getting some awards because of this whole thing. Citizen of the Year and so on and so forth. Life was really great. And then I left county government for eight more years to take the job as the director of the Orangewood Children's Foundation. That was the private sector group that teamed up to build the children's shelter. And then out of the blue in 1993, the governor appointed me to the Board of Supervisors. I had one week to do that. I was only the third or fourth former county employee in over 100 years 
to serve on the Board of Supervisors. Now, instead of going down with my hat in my hand telling the administration, hey, I need some additional staff in the nursery because I'm getting HIV babies for the first time. And I got these heroin withdrawal babies. And, well, Bill, you know, you got to do your part there. You know, I, you know that all the departments are having to cut their budgets 10%. Didn't have to do that as a member of the Board of Supervisors. All I had to do was get two of my colleagues to agree with me that we ought to do this for abused kids in Orange County, get the votes, boom, problem solved. I give you this context because almost immediately with the bankruptcy, I went from an image of doing God's work with abused and neglected kids, having a good reputation, and seriously, I wanted to do a good job in terms of governance. From there to being criticized and vilified. I'm not asking you to feel sorry for my predicament. My perspective is that it went, it goes with the territory. Dan, can you do the narrative slide? <clears throat> so, what we see here is on December 4th, 1994, um, Ernie Schneider, our CAO, went to Robert Citron's home and to, uh, on a Sunday, by the way, to force the longtime elected official to resign. What you may not know is that we were so, so concerned about Robert Citron and what would happen that we sent a mental health team there because we worried about suicide. The county was girding for this financial firestorm. They talked, at least Citroen did, well, it's a paper loss of about $1.5 billion. But the emphasis on paper loss, for those of you who understand all this finance stuff, implied that the county just had to hang on to its investments and allow them to mature and there'd be no loss. But it had grown over time from 7.6 billion in deposits, from 180 spe city, special districts, and school districts, to 20.6 billion, thanks in large measure to, to precariously leveraged interest rate bets, known as reverse purchase agreements and other exotic names. Citron turned, thank you, Dan. Citron the architect, which turned out to be a very risky, but ultimately illegal scheme to inflate the county's treasury, had been betting that interest rates would fall throughout the summer. They didn't, and you can of course read the PowerPoint. Banks that lent the, lent the county demanded more cash as collateral and threatened to seize county securities used to secure loans. But the additional component that's not part of this, uh, but which was very significant, is that there was a run on the bank by members of the pool, these 180 entities, that was increasingly worried about the risk and wanted to withdraw their deposits. So the house of cards was ready to collapse. So it wasn't a paper loss, it was a real loss of around $1.64 billion, the largest municipal bankruptcy at that time. Citron resigned, He'd been there 24 years. Two days later, the county declared Chapter 9 bankruptcy, a little used strategy for municipal debt, which I've already spoken about. What followed after that was several things, but a, there was a huge effort to emerge from bankruptcy, but the question was how to recapitalize 1.6 billion dollars and get everyone going in the same direction for a global settlement. For about the next year and a half, there was this intricate web of action by the county, state legislature, and the federal court that led the county to be able to emerge from bankruptcy in, uh, in about a year and a half. But of course, we took on bond debt to repay the pool investors. One lesson that I learned 
is that there's always, there's apparently always money to land. It's a question of at what price? Because the interest rates were higher to borrow money. They had something, you had to get insurance on stuff. There were all sorts of fees, but we were able to, to do that. But again, on December 6, 1994, at the Hall of Administration, things had gotten pretty horrible. For the media, the Times and the Register and the media, there was months-long, 16-hour days trying to unravel what had gone on, discover what was happening out of public view, decipher the complicated financial instruments, previously known to many, and inform the public what it all meant. The media attention during that time was unprecedented. Remember, newspaper circulation in 1994 was twice what it is today. And in fact, the, Orange, the Los Angeles Times had an Orange County edition. They really don't have that today. So, the, especially the Register took some big hits for not having been diligent enough in detecting the looming debacle, despite being warned. There was a, a, a headline, the watchdogs didn't bark. So people in Orange County kind of tried to figure out what all this means. And they were somewhere between sort of being clueless and being furious. How could this bastion of governmental conservatism find itself in such a meltdown? And then, Adding to the equation was the new reliance, because it was a new reliance, on Sacramento for sources of revenue. County government had been a really important and high-profile beat for both newspapers, even though the public didn't have a firm grasp on what county government did. Uh, a public opinion a po a, a poll before the bankruptcy thought most of the Re, the residents of the county thought that the county was responsible for bus service. Not the case. It's the Orange County Transportation Authority, which, by the way, OCT had a billion dollars in this pool. When I ran for office on the Board of Supervisors in 1994, we did a, a, a poll, and only 27% of the respondents even knew who their county supervisor was. So it was kind of kind of humbling, but about the only person they really know who was who was Brad Gates, who was a very popular sheriff. So once this bankruptcy situation become clearer, the voters were asked to put a half cent sales tax on, on, the, uh, on the ballot to help pay and um, as a bailout measure. Um, and then the public streamed into the Board of Supervisors meetings. They threatened recalls, defiance, and worse. I mean, we're kind of used to that nowadays, but it, that is, there was a lot of civility to be in a councilman or being a member of the board in 1994 and earlier. Um, I actually had to go out in the dark in my bathrobe to my driveway to get my newspapers so I could read the headlines. I mean, it was that, it was that bad. We had these gadflies that lined up before the microphone. One, his name was Will B. King, Will B. King. <laughs> and he, he dressed in drag and he was really strange and so forth. And one night, because we were going till midnight, 1 a.m. sometimes, I'm leaving the Hall of Administration. I pull out on Santa Ana Boulevard make a right turn, and there's Will B. King standing on the curb. And he says, Supervisor Steiner, Supervisor Steiner, stop. And I stopped and rolled down my window. He says, could you give me a ride to Costa Mesa? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm going to Orange. He says, oh, yeah, but, and in my mind, I'm thinking, this guy's going to be found under a bush in the morning. He, I need to give him a ride. That's part of the social worker coming out in me. So I says, get in the car. So we drive down one block. We stop at a red light. These gangbangers are walking across the street. And I'm sitting there in my car. And we'll be kings there in drag. And I go, oh my god, please change from red to green. <laughs> and I got him to Costa Mesa and I dropped him off and went home. 
And the next morning, Brad Gates was in my office. He says, Bill, he says, why did you give Wilby King a ride? And so I told him the story. He says, are you aware that he's made some sort of a bomb threat from, for, at Cal State Fullerton? Well, no. He says, Bill, I think it's dangerous for you to do that. And then, you know, later he was on, in Time Magazine because he was at the O.J. Simpson trial in Los Angeles. They had a picture of him. And so I went, oh, my God, well, I won't do that again. And then he comes to the next board meeting, and he gets up there to harangue the board, but he says, oh, and I want to thank Supervisor Steiner for giving me a ride to Costa Mesa. <laughs> yeah. So overnight, this kind of quirky Robert Citron, who had been touted, you see this on the slide, in news fe features, he loved turquoise jewelry and USC. By the way, he played the USC fight song on his, on his horn, on his car. He never graduated from USC. He, was, uh, he had a bank of color-coordinated phones directly connected to brokerages. He had a zen-like demand of the market. He was sort of an international villain. The French newspapers, The Economist headline, talking about the debacle, had a twist on the French term lemonade for Citroen. He had no formal training in finance, and he later admitted to consulting astrologers before investing. He had convinced the state legislature in 1979 to allow county treasurers to use the investments they held as collateral to borrow even more money, a strategy eagerly adopted by several pool participants to boost their returns. Who was this guy that was elected to six four-year terms? Why did I make out my property tax bill to Robert Bob Citron instead of just to the county of Orange? I don't know. Um, he eventually served a year in jail for misleading investors, falsifying documents, misappropriating public funds, and siphoning almost 90 million bucks in excess profits, profits made from the pool participants, pool investments to the county treasury. Now, his year, his time in the Orange County Jail, he handed out commissary supplies and went home in the evening to sleep in his own house. But the Orange County Register, in covering the county fiscal situation in the 1990s, were concerned about, about expenses outpacing revenue and talked about it. And so there was all this pressure, not just on Orange County, but on others as well, um, to, uh, uh, to deal with the, the, the fears of layoffs and uh, to deal that, with that situation. But the danger signs actually surfaced in 1990 or 1978 with the passage of Prop 13 and then further realignment of tax revenue by the legislature in the 1990s. So miracle worker Citron managed to track greater than expected interest earnings. There'd be no layoffs. General Tom Riley on the Board of Supervisors remarked at one point of Citron, I don't know how he does it, but he makes us all look good. I was on the school board in Orange and we were facing a shortfall, but we had money invested in the county portfolio. And it, the earnings, the interest earnings kept us and saved the day for us in terms of laying off teachers. So anyway, once the dust settled on all this and county government finally repaid the pool investors, it cost the county $68 million over the next 21 years that couldn't be used elsewhere. OCTA lost about $200 million in sales tax dollars earmarked for bankruptcy bond repayment. So state reform put a leash on the volatile investments that had generated illegal and diverted profits. And then citizens advisory groups convened to oversee finances. County government centralized and reorganized went from 18,000 down to about 15,000 employees. Um, that number recovered by 2009. Today in 2020, there's 18,000 county employees. And the budget's $6.3 billion, okay? 
Funding cuts were really tough for social services and the health care agency, and I sort of battled to make sure that Orangewood Children's Home was uh, protected. So um, the, the, the trust in county government as a result of the bankruptcy was really shattered. And it would be evidenced for a decade after the bankruptcy, the county didn't trust, the, the cities didn't trust the county. They added four more cities in Orange County. Now we have 34 cities. They were all concerned about whether the county was going to put an airport at El Toro, the cities were. And um, today, if you go to Wikipedia, as it says in the slide, there's just basically one word, one brief reference to the Orange County bankruptcy. So my question to you, is it truly an afterthought? I told some of my older grandchildren that I was making this presentation on the Orange County bankruptcy. And they didn't have a clue at what I was talking about. I have a son who went to UCI and went to law school. He's a judge. I said, Scott, do you hear anything about the Orange County bankruptcy 25 years ago? Not really. My only suggestion for my grandkids was, Grandpa, don't tell your audience all these long stories that you have. <laughs> don't. So I worried about this presentation. I didn't know I would know anybody here. Um, I thought with bankruptcy, even under the best of circumstances, you know, you feel like dozing off a little bit. Maybe your eyes are going to glaze over. That's why I ask my question at the beginning of my presentation and why I was reassured that so many of you did know about the Orange County bankruptcy and how, whether it impacted you in any way and so forth. So I'm glad I'm not talking to a bunch of young college students. So um, let's go ahead, Dan, and put up slide two, the amount that was invested in the Orange County pool. Right? Is it there? Okay, look, look at that. I mean, $5.1 billion, and the original investments were $7.6 billion. And then by November of 1994, a month before the bankruptcy, the pool's worth $20.9 billion because of borrowed investments. Why would 180 entities put all their money in the Orange County investment pool, even some cities outside of Orange County. The simple answer was that was the source of tax dollars that were being, re being reduced and reallocated by Sacramento and the state legislature. The loss of control over revenue started in 1978. You know all about that. That Taxpayer revolt limited the increases in our property taxes to 2% a year. And it set an assessment base for our house uh, based in 1975. The impact on my family um, was that our home, which we bought in Orange in 1971 for $34,000 and raised five kids in, simply didn't take a hit as property values increased in Orange County. So much so that when we sold it to our daughter and her husband and their family, we were able to transfer that assessed valuation on that house to a place we bought in Orange in Serrano Heights. Now my property assessment for this new house, for this house, which I've been in for 17 years, was $98,000. And my tax bill was a little over $3,000. So believe me, I do not tell my next door neighbors what my taxes are as they're paying $12,000 a year in taxes. My point is that as a school board member, we didn't control our allocation from Sacramento in terms of education funding. But we still had uh, responsibility to balance our budget, have an efficient operation, pay teacher salaries, modernize older schools, and build new ones. And so that budgetary pressure impacted all public.
public agencies, cities, schools, special districts. And then there was other shifts in 1992 and 1993, which put on more pressure. Add in the fact that Orange County received one of the lowest allocations of property tax money out of 58 counties in California, seven cents on the dollar. What county received the highest proportion of property tax dollars, do you know? LA County, LA County was close, but do you know who was the highest? San Francisco. Why, why? Because Willie Brown was Speaker of the Assembly. It's that simple, that simple. And uh, Orange County was perceived as this wealthy, conservative county that didn't have all these requirements for funding that happened in other cities. And frankly, not much attention was spent to the Republican legislators from Orange County. So the result was this dilemma, and the Orange County portfolio helped to fill the gap with significant interest income to lessen the pain of cutbacks, layoffs, budgetary planning, and challenges. Now, it's one thing when, as private citizens, we're trying to maximize our own investments, our, get a little bit more interest on our savings, get a CD that pays a little more in interest, but it's an entirely different matter when this effort involves other people's money and is based on a strategy of borrowing money to build up interest earnings. And then, as I already mentioned, insult is added to injury when Citroen is skimming out some interest earnings because it's so damn high every, every month, every year, putting $100 million into a separate fund the cities didn't know anything about. And 1.40% of the county's general fund money was composed of interest earnings. Can we show, Dan, the slide on sources of general fund revenue, slide three? So take a look at the revenue for Orange County. At first, a small um, amount of interest and a larger amount of property taxes in 1989 and 1990. Then look at the year before the bankruptcy and, uh, and uh, wow, what a huge increase and the tremendous reliance on interest serving, interest earnings. But you may say, well, gee, out of a $3 billion budget, that's not that huge amount of money. But what you've got to understand that most of the budget in county government is pass-through money. It's coming from the feds and from the state, um, especially for health care programs and social service programs. But also there are other departments, is this still okay? Other departments where expenses were offset by fees, such as the planning department and the Department of Public Works. So the Board of Supervisors on this big $3 billion plus budget only had decision-making authority on about 10% of the total budget. That represented what we call, and that's the same case today, that represents what we call our discretionary revenue that we had to work with. It paid for departments and functions that used general fund revenue and was not covered by the state or federal government. That included the probation department, the sheriff's department, the office of the district attorney, the register of voters, the assessor's office, and then some county overhead that was spread. So my point is, is that those interest earnings that Robert Citron was generating was really the only safety in terms of dealing with our budgetary pressures. So, what else was I seeing as a brand new county supervisor? Um, there was a Costa Mesa CPA by the name of John Morlock. He decided to run against Bob Citron as the county treasurer tax collector and made claims about the portfolio collapsing. That was in the spring of 1994. I was the new kid on the block. I felt uncomfortable with what I was reading, but people weren't paying a lot of attention to it. 
So I asked the director of public finance for the county to draft a letter from me to Robert Citron and um, ask him to clarify his investment practices and strategies. The response from the bureaucracy over my simple request resulted in them roaring up to my office and saying, Supervisor, Supervisor, they blitzed me. I'm just saying that's the way it was. And told, told me that my inquiry to Robert Citron could jeopardize the county investment pool. So I backed off. The letter was not sent. The election in June resulted in 134,000 votes for John Morlock, but Robert Citron beat him by over 75,000 votes and was elected to his sixth term as the county treasurer tax collector. I think John's criticism at that time was simply seen as election politics and dismissed by decision makers and the public as well. All the while, please understand this, the rating agencies and the investment bankers were reassuring Orange County that the portfolio was just fine. It should be noted that companies like Merrill Lynch were making millions of dollars in fees as they encouraged the use of the county for these various investment strategies. By the fall, just a, a month or two before the bankruptcy, there was this frantic effort to assess the risk to county, the county investment portfolio. Was it more than paper losses? And representatives of Solomon Brothers from New York were hired to come in and assess. But by Sunday night, we went to bed after the weekend, went to bed Sunday night by Monday morning, December 5th, 1994, at 4 a.m., the phone rang, and all the five supervisors were told to get down to the Hall of Administration. And we walked in, got off the elevator, went to our offices, and then we were immediately handicapped because the Brown Act prevented us from, it wasn't any agendized meeting, from talking about what was going on. We could not have more than two supervisors together at any one time. So that certainly affected communication. And it was frantic on the fifth floor and on the third floor of the Hall of Administration at this early time in the morning. Um, people were talking about selling the entire portfolio of 21, selling it on New York. They were on long distance calls to New York or declaring bankruptcy. We all, we all got our assignments and I was told that my assignment was to call the governor and tell him what was going on in Orange County. And so I tracked Pete Wilson down in San Diego. He was at a breakfast and he was getting ready to get on a plane and I told the governor what was going on in Orange County and that it looked likely that the next day we would be filing for bankruptcy. And he was supportive, but he said, Bill, we've got our own problems with the state. I'm not sure what we can do to be helpful. Later, of course, the state was helpful in many ways with legislation. So boom, the bankruptcy was announced the next day on the 6th of December, 1994, 25 years ago. It was a national news story. Uh, it was the folk, do you remember OCN, the cable station, you know, that the register had? It was quite a sophisticated operation. Man, they, they just devoted daily, daily stuff to this. Uh, there was all this finger pointing and railing in terms of how to deal with the complexities of the bankruptcy and its impact on the county. I met a lot of fair weather friends. Uh, I saw a lot of betrayals. I saw loyalties and extraordinary efforts to solve the problems. I saw really angry pool participants. Where's our damn money? Schools panicked. And then, of course, the developers and the business community. Wow, what about our, what about our Melarus assessment 
stuff. What about this? What about that? What about, can I get a, uh, can I get a tentative tract map approved by the county for my 500 houses in South County? What's going to happen? Wow. I remember a, fr- a phone call I got from a friend who says, Bill, I've got airport bonds. My God, am I going to lose my investment? Are they going to end up worthless? I says, wait, slow down, slow down. John Wayne Airport is an enterprise fund. It's got its own revenue. It's got its own expenses. It's in fine shape. No problems. No problems. Hang on to your, hang on to your investments. But then we were able in June of 1995, 18 months later, to get Wall Street to loan us $278 million to begin the process of repayment. First in line, the schools. First in line were the schools. And so that required guarantees, and I don't remember all the details, but I remember that it had to get a letter of credit and so forth, and insurance, I don't know, it was a Japanese firm, and we paid a lot of high fees, but we got the $278 million and we started paying off the debt. I got pulled into a meeting uh, which was attended by Gary Hunt, who was Don Bren's chief guy at the Irvine Company, and also by Tom Sutton, who was the CEO of Pacific Life, and by George Arduous, who was, he and Bill Lyon owned Air Cal, he owned the Saddle Mariners, he was president of the board of trustees of Chapman. And they sit, sat down just with them and me, and they said, Bill, you can't let the county default. Bill, you realize that even Cuba didn't default at some time in the past? And I said, well, well wait a minute. You forget. My family taught me you always pay your bills. We're going to do whatever we have to do. Well, Bill... Do you realize that irrespective of any political consequences, you gotta support, um, you gotta support a major R to increase taxes by, by half a cent on the dollar. And, you know, in those days, um, in those days, uh, you know, um, the Republican Party and the Lincoln Club dominated the politics. Could we get up that slide of the party registration in 1994? And, whoop, nope, we're not going to go there. We're going to, it's going to be slide uh, 10. Slide 10. Thank you. There we go. So take a look in 1994. And so I had, um, I met with, I was with Doy Henley, who was uh, president of the Lincoln Club then. And he, I was at his home uh, last week. And he's 91 years old, almost 91. And he's former chairman of the Chapman University uh, Board of Trustees. And he, even then, he says, Bill, he said, um, you, you, you know, you guys, you shouldn't have declared bankruptcy. And we'll get into that finally. I'm almost winding this up. And um, so um, he said, uh, to the, in the Lincoln Club with meetings with county people, you, um, you, you, this is bull. You don't need to have a half cent sales tax. And then people who are going to run for office, they're worried that if they vote for a sales tax, that um, it's going to doom them in terms of uh, getting elected, reelected. Well, I was a, a good solid moderate in 1994. And I was not going to go off the Newport Beach Pier for ideology. No problem. I'll vote to put it on the ballot. Even though Solomon Brothers told me they didn't think it would pass. It didn't. It didn't pass. So um, we then had to pay the price. Heartbreaking layoffs program reductions, careers destroyed, many people caught up in it, a lot of self-doubt. One person who was on my board at Orangewood said, you know, Bill, 
uh, maybe it'd be good if everybody resigned and we started with a clean slate with the Board of Supervisors. Now remember, Harriet Weider and General Tom Riley retired after 20 plus years at that time. Gaddy Vasquez, he resigned and moved on. So two of us were left standing, Roger Stanton and me. And so, Bill, don't you think it might be okay to just sort of bail out and start fresh? And I said, wait a minute, I just got here. I just got here. And then George Arjua says, Steiner, come over and work for me. You don't need to deal with this BS. And then Doug DeSensei, we were in the Indian guys together with our sons, third baseman for the Angels. He came in my office. He says, Bill, you've got to stay. You've got to see this through. I would never let the manager take me out of the bottom of the ninth. You've got to see it through. So I saw it through. Citroen is out. Ernie Schneider is out. There's this recall talk. The Secure and Exchange Commission is having sanctions. There's endless depositions. Then all of a sudden the grand jury says, well, we're issuing, this is a year after the bankruptcy, we're issuing willful misconduct in office charges. I said, you've got to be kidding. I had, because everybody knew about that. I mean, the DA's office knew this stuff was going on. I says, what the hell are you talking about? So I had to go hire a lawyer and pay $25,000 of my own money try to, to try to stop that from happening. Thank God my colleagues indemnified me and Roger Stanton for the defense and the 4th District Court of Appeal threw the whole damn thing out eventually. But it was brutal. It was brutal. Um, that siege went on for months and months and months. Everyone paid a huge price. So what did the workout look like? What was the workout? A lot of very smart people got involved to try to save the day. The bankruptcy froze everything in place in order to have an orderly process to make investors whole. Bruce Bennett was our BK attorney. Excerpts from the business <coughs> experts <coughs> from the business community found out the hard way that government is not easily run like a business. It really isn't. There were recommendations for us to sell John Wayne Airport. There were recommendations to privatize various county functions and departments. But through all this, we started making progress. Most pool participants put aside their angry feelings and began working together for a global settlement to recapitalize and pay vendors the most immediate debt. Required all these pool participants to pass their obligations and their claims onto the county so there would be a coordinated effort. As I said, schools were first in line. About 12 cities <coughs> and other entities decided to go, in their, go their own way, file their own lawsuits, and wait for settlements. We called them the killer bees. Included one of my cities in my district, Buena Park. I was involved <coughs> in going to trips to New York, Chicago, and San Francisco to meet with the rating agencies such as Standards & Poor's, Fitch & Moody's. And I met with all these investment bankers. Solomon Brothers was our key facilitator. I might refer to you that one of their employees was assigned to Orange County for a year and a half. His name was Chris Varellis. And he wrote a book called, this, this came out in November, How Money Became Dangerous, which has a chapter on the Orange County bankruptcy. So here I am at these meetings. Well, I'm, and you know, here again, I didn't have all this depth of knowledge about finances, but I was scripted by the lawyers and by the by the financial folks so that I could carry on a decent conversation, which was basically reassuring these folks that Orange County was going to be okay, that it was a tremendous, tremendously successful county that could weather this, and we would all make this all right. 
So then the slide eight, slide eight, the role of legislation. Legislation was really especially helpful to us. Um, here's some of the legislation that took place. Uh, revenue streams were diverted from various departments such as harbors, beaches, and parks. OCT had something called the Bradley Burn Sales Tax. That was diverted. Flood control, the county administered funds, and on and on and on. And then <clears throat> I got a phone call <clears throat> from the Chicago Tribune, from a reporter. And he said to me, Supervisor Steiner, is it true that Orange County is going to bring in San Diego's garbage into its landfills? I had my soundbite already. I says, well, yeah, it's better than closing libraries. That shut him up, okay? We also, over litigation, start getting settlements from these investment bankers. Merrill Lynch paid us back for over $400 million. We recovered $830 million from lawsuits. Accountability systems were restructured. Efforts were made to um, rebuild trust. We then eventually ended up with, um, just making sure I'm on time, we eventually ended up with uh, um, the ability to borrow again. We had this A-plus investment grade. We took on bond debt. We reorganized. Um, uh, but we had to pay $68 million a year for 21 years. Plus, of course, we had to hand out the litigation settlements. But after one and a half years, the Orange County emerged from bankruptcy with a comprehensive uh, settlement agreement. Pool participants were fully paid. And in 2005, the remaining <coughs> bankruptcy debt was refinanced which took 10 years off the payment schedule and saved millions of dollars in interest. Now, the big $64 question. Did Orange County have to file bankruptcy? <clears throat> or could it have been avoided? I'm really not quite sure how to answer this question because I've heard for years that San Diego County was involved in a similar mess and didn't file for bankruptcy and felt that Orange County had overreacted. Over the years, I occasionally heard that Orange County had jumped the gun and really should have just gone ahead and defaulted on debt, which would have subsequently been paid off. But everything I saw as a county supervisor during the weeks, especially around the declaration of, of bankruptcy, indicated to me that we had no choice. We had like, we had a huge cash flow problem. Just before the bankruptcy was declared, $600 million in tax revenue anticipation notes were sold to manage cash flow until property taxes arrived in December and April. And that was a normal practice. It was usual. Those trends, those trends, however, ramped up the pool balances to generate further investment income. Something which I don't really know about is called inverse floaters. Better that interest rates would go down. They didn't. They went up. And those funds somehow weren't secured by anything. The pool was melting down. The Irvine Ranch Water District and other participants were, withdraw were withdrawing millions of dollars of their deposit when they started getting nervous about the safety of the pool. There was panic. CS First Boston had the right to call $1.2 billion that was due to ramp down their exposure. There simply wasn't enough cash flow to meet the demand. Vendors had to be paid. We had people calling us saying, we're providing food for the jail. When are we going to get paid? Salaries had to be paid, even with the workforce um, decreased by close to 3,000 employees. Almost 100 engineering contracts were canceled. Other projects were put on hold. If everyone had gone their own way, then I think there would have been endless litigation, maybe eventually resolution, but the county came to the conclusion we had to get all our 
participants, almost all, involved in the workout. And we did. So what's the fate of the key players? I've already alluded to Robert Citrin, slide nine, Dan. Oh my God. Uh, as I said, the county elected officials, the, those of us on the board, there was a lot of distrust of the bureaucracy in terms of what we were told. Were we being given good information? Cities and counties, as I've said, were really skeptical of county government. There was a bunch of checks and balances put into place. The authority of the auditor controller was reduced and power placed in a performance auditor. Citizens groups were put together, something called PFAC, Public Finance Advisory Committee. Legislation was passed that prevented the use of volatile investments, which I've already mentioned to you. There was the recognition that if interest earnings are unusually high, then they are probably risky in terms of their exposure to downside, duh, that is something I've known forever. The board had annual strategic planning sessions to prioritize their annual budgets, examine debt and liabilities and how to generate sufficient income. So, in, I believe, I believe, despite you'll hear from other people that think that we should have toughed it out or something, I thought we toughed it out. Um, I think we did have to file for bankruptcy. Now to wind up, talk about kind of a summary and sort of the role of leadership in solving problems. I took this, I've been working on this for weeks, I took this from a speech I gave to the California State Association of Counties annual meeting in November 2002, 17 years ago. And I told these folks, I said, you know, a crisis like the Orange County bankruptcy in 1994 forced those responsible for governance and for those responsible for managing the workforce and service to the county residents to exercise leadership, to rethink their mission, to restructure the organization, and to get the right leaders in place to deal effectively with the challenges. I'm not sure that I was able to do that, but I wasn't recalled. I stayed the course. I served as uh, chairman of the board in 1997. When I left office in 1999, I had a greater appreciation of the complexities of county government and the kind of organization and leadership required to do the job. So what does it take? <clears throat> what should the skill set of those who are elected to public office or who manage large departments or services be. I think certainly, let's just talk, I'm just focusing on local government, not the legislature, not the national picture. <clears throat> I do think that most people who run for office have personal qualities and skills inherently tied to the exercise of leadership, some more than others. Consider someone who puts together a campaign inherently uh, goes through an election and he's usually or she's usually is willing to take risk, has the organizational ability and is able to think strategically, supports teamwork, has a vision or specific goals that need to be achieved, is able to motivate people, is inclined to compromise and accept trade-offs, and I think is closest to the constituency that elected them to office. Can elected officials let others lead? To some extent, elected officials give up an element of control and authority when they hire strong leaders. Cities may have a very strong city manager form of government, but counties may struggle with just exactly who should be the boss. Remember, for years in Orange County, there were five of us, and we were kind of like being a CEO for our district. And then there was a weak county administrator for years. Department heads often did an end run around the CAO, going directly to their favorite supervisor. Each supervisor had what was called district prerogative. We called the shots in our own district. For me, I could call the shots in Anaheim, Orange, Placentia, La Palma, and Buena Park. Um, broader countywide problems 
was not as important. For example, now the huge broad area is homelessness. It's got to take a countywide approach, okay? The debate raged at that time in the 90s and 80s that county government was operated like a fiefdom rather than like a business which had clear lines of authority and channels of communication. But for some elected officials, there was a reluctance to give up control, to delegate authority, to hire strong leaders, or to govern in the broader sense. Micromanagement was preferred by some, and I always used to hear it's always dangerous to give elected officials too much information. Okay? When the bankruptcy hit Orange County, there was a lot of finger pointing. Elected supervisors who in the past demanded to be in charge found it difficult to blame the bureaucracy. In fact, blaming Robert Citron was implied since he was an elected official. But because he was an elected official, it was difficult to hold him accountable at any level. What made this more difficult is that the financial prof professionals outside of county government and the investment bankers, the broker-dealers, and even the rating agencies had somehow supported Citroen's risky practices, and then the media didn't pick up on it. So what was the bottom line as Orange County emerged from bankruptcy in terms of leadership? A strong CEO was hired and given more authority. Department heads and managers had to face the new reality or they left the county. Those that remained had to produce business plans with measurable objectives. Isn't that reasonable? New leaders were hired who could think out of the box. Layoffs and budget cuts, I know guys, you don't want to hear about it, but in some cases it's an inevitable and non-negotiable. The board was forced to set priorities. We called, we had sessions, we called them big rocks and little rocks, and we prioritized our goals. There was a focus on strategic planning and more accountability. So the big question in terms of all this leadership pitch is will the lessons be forgotten and will history repeat itself? Should leadership only emerge out of crisis? Well in a crisis someone has to rise to the occasion to lead the way, but leadership should be encouraged in the normal course of events because it makes sense. It's an insurance policy, an insurance policy against bad stuff happening. Counties have an extraordinarily difficult job. There may not be another bankruptcy, but the problem of unfunded pension liabilities is a huge threat. Even without that issue, you can count on having to face unpredictable state and federal sources of revenue. The elected official is probably always going to be second-guessed. The county can always be count on on having to provide services that no one else wants to provide. The county will always have increasingly diverse constituency and a demanding one at that. And there's no shortage of people who feel they can do it better than you. Finally, I encourage those in leadership at any level, political or otherwise, to hire the best and the brightest. Empower them. If they're successful, it reflects on you. When things go wrong, don't kill the messenger. Stand with them and take the heat, and you'll be respected if you do. As far as perspective, remember, it's not a perfect world, and you can only do so much, but still try. But it's not 1994 or 2002 when I put together these thoughts so long ago. It's 2020. With this advice given so long that was so long ago that was rooted in my perspectives, my value system, my family expectations, professional career, and political journey work today. Remember, I was surrounded in my childhood by the greatest generation. Then I grew up in what my peers tell me today was the best of times in many ways. I'm too old to be considered a baby boomer, but I do know something about millennials who were born between 1980 and 1994, or 1981 and 1986, depending on the source. I have 16 grandchildren, ages 5 through 28, and some of them are millennials. 
and in Orangewood and in the foster care program, I worked with millennials and I lectured at college classes filled with millennials. And friends, I know I can say this now because I see my audience, they are a piece of work. <laughs> so what happened yesterday, what happened Thursday, at 4.30 a.m. when I got up to go to the bathroom, like most people my age, well, I was wired over anticipating this presentation today. So I go back and I go to my phone, my cell phone. I don't go out in the driveway, that's for sure. No newspapers being delivered. And what do I see as the lead story in Time magazine? How millennial leaders will change America. It goes on to say that American politics is still defined by the values and priorities of baby boomers. But it won't be long because one day, millennials will rule America. They are already the largest living generation and the largest age group in the workforce. They outnumber Gen X and will soon outnumber baby boomers among American voters. Their startups have revolutionized the economy. Their tastes have shifted the culture and their enormous appetite for social media has transformed human interaction. American politics is the next area ripe for disruption. But it may take years, maybe decades, for millennials to be proportionally represented in the hall of power. The question I have for you, and perhaps the topic of another distinguished guest lecture, is what leadership is needed for those future challenges. A challenge that will dwarf what we had to deal with in terms of the Orange County bankruptcy 25 years ago. I won't be around for this generational change, but I really do love my millennial grandchildren. And I want them to rise to whatever challenge they experience. Therefore, I will still answer their phone calls, shake my head at some of their choices, tell them short stories, and give them my input because I still believe that the lessons are learned, especially from respected family members or mentors, and perhaps mistakes can be avoided, although their definition of a mistake might be different than mine. On that positive note, thank you so much for asking me to speak to you today. Ten fifty nine. Can you believe it? <laughs> wow. Dan, thank you for helping me with that. Thank, thank you. Right thank you. Yes. We're going to take some questions now for Mr. Steiner. Just get time for mics to get around. You have a question? Raise your hand. Someone will come with a mic. We'll start right over here. Okay. Thank you for Is coming it on? today, Is it on? Mr. Yes. Steiner. I have a question about unfunded liabilities. Okay. Uh, can, we, can we please keep it down? If you could stay, it'd be great. My too. question is, are they doing, is anybody doing anything to solve this problem? Because services for every city are being diverted to pay for these unfunded liabilities and uh, the people are suffering, uh, programs are being cut to pay up all these uh, monies. What is your uh, feeling about it? Can anything be done? And uh, what, what do you have to say about that? Thank you very much. It's a huge problem and that's why I alluded to it. It's almost another topic for one of these lecture series because it is significant. We already know that the public employees retirement system, the biggest in the country, is only about 70% funded. And we know that they used to get huge amounts of interest that pretty much covered everything and now they don't. But what is happening, because every city and every county that I know is struggling about how to deal with this. First of all, they're making the county and the city employees pay more into their retirement. About 18% more 
18% is paid by county employees now that in the past wasn't paid for. So that's, that's helpful. That's helpful to share. Further, elected officials used to give increases in retirement because they didn't want to have the visibility of increases in pay, okay? That would be in the newspaper. Now, everybody at the elected level is thinking, what are my decisions going to do to our employee workforce and our budget? So there's some partial solutions. Obviously, um, it's not solved. It's not solved, and you're absolutely right since 50 or 60 percent of the city budgets go to public safety, and if you don't have good public safety in your city, what else you got? So you got to have a big priority for that. But at some point, you have to be reasonable in terms of the benefits that you pay for people who are retired. So it's, it's a work in progress. But, and it's, it's not just California. It's throughout America, and you'll read war story after war story. You ought to listen to John Morlock. He's a senator in the legislature. You ought to hear what he has to say about unfunded pension liabilities. But thank you for the question. Thank Not an easy answer. Right, right up here in the front Yes, row. okay. Robert Citrin seemed to be the key to this bankruptcy. What happened to the 90 million, and did you guys establish in his 24-year career when he turned the corner and started to make these risky investments? Well, he got the, he got the approval to, to, to invest in these, in these mechanisms in 1979 from the legislature. It all ramped up in the 90s uh, with regard to the transferring of a couple billion dollars in funding to the schools by the state of California, and so that his interest earnings became much more important. And then over five years, it was a five-year process. It became more and more important. Never went into his pocket. Never. He just was the, he just was the hero by producing so much revenue from interest earnings. And he bet wrong on interest rates. And then it all came unraveling within about a year and a half. Did I fully answer that? What's 90 million? 90 million. Oh, well, first of all, believe me, the money was paid to the schools and to the cities that lost, and those monies flowed out. The litigation proceeds flew, uh, f went out to pay the investors so that they didn't ultimately lose their investment. But boy, was there a lot of heartburn. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Right over here. Hi. Yes. Orange County has always been a donor county on a state level. Yes. It has, continues to be so recently until now. But also, I heard last year from former Congresswoman Sanchez that federal money was allocated to Orange County, but the Board of Supervisors did not spend it. Do you know anything about that? Boy, I don't think I missed spending a dime when I was on the Board of Supervisors because we needed every, every kind of support we could get in grants and everything you can imagine. But yeah, I would, th I would think maybe over a period of years because Orange County had this conservative um, uh, aura of being wealthy and there was a lot of money to go around before some of these Prop 13 and things occurred. I would say probably they didn't chase grants, but remember, that's taxpayer money too, okay, that goes to Washington, D.C. Should we get our fair share? Yes, and we should get our fair share of money from the state legislature. We don't, because it has to do with clout, clout. But I know Loretta, and that's a legitimate concern that, hey, maybe they missed the bet. Right now, Orange County is in a fury to get money to deal with homelessness. That's what it was for. Yeah, well, but they are, they're in a fear, because so much money is being made available for homelessness, the, the county and the cities are going after what's available. Uh, they'd like to get more Section 8 vouchers from the federal government, but as far as the money that's flowing through 
the state of California general fund, it's a lot. And here's the problem. LA County adopted tax increases, and last year, LA County paid $520 million towards their homeless problem. Remember, there's 60,000 homeless in LA County. What happened was after spending all that money trying to get people in shelters and doing this and doing that, permanent supportive housing, homelessness in LA County last year went up 16%. So it's not all about having plenty of money, it's all about community attitudes. We had to suck it up in orange because we had 720 people on the trails of the Santa Ana River. We couldn't, you couldn't go down there and do any running or bicycling. And finally, we said, enough's enough. And now, you know, we've got program for children that Homemade helped us build in Orange um, to take care of homeless families. And we got $5 million we invested in a mental health crisis center on a needed drive in Orange. And then we supported the Anaheim shelter called the Bridges. And then we supported the Salvation Army, 200 beds up in Anaheim and in Buena Park. And then in, in Fullerton last week approved 150 beds. So it's not just, it's not just money because there's, we had 200, we had 24 busloads of residents from Irvine come to the County Hall of Administration and say there's no way you're putting any homeless encampment on the 100 acres the county owns next to the Great Park. Very complicated. I think that the problem that I faced dealing with the child abuse and neglect in 1978, which I thought was horrendous, was a piece of cake compared to dealing with homelessness. But you made a good point. Yes, ma'am. Question right here on the back of this section. I was concerned how much can the governor and the state do to prevent counties from getting stuck in this black hole of debt. It doesn't seem to me like the state was supervising their end of the deal. How could the, how could the state do what? How could they help counties avoid bad investment advice or improper... Oh. Well, ask the legislature in 1979 to let Citroen go do his own thing. I don't know. Yeah. Don't know. But there should be always oversight. But remember, in local government and in cities, it's all about self-determination. San Clemente, don't you be telling us what we should do about homeless on our beaches. It's our business. Okay? Self-determination. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm I may be oh, I may be wrong. I'm sorry. But I may be wrong, but I understand that when funds are allocated for a certain uh, job, let's say, and it's not used, it is pushed the funds are pushed for use within that period, uh, whether it's really necessary or not, such as beautification of our roads, let's say. Why can that money that has not been used be put into the next budget to be used for something more important? There, that's, a, that's a great question. G generally speaking, on the Board of Supervisors, we all want our departments to operate efficiently. So we always say, what is your ending balances for the fiscal year? And because they budget for so many positions and then they don't fill them right away and so forth, there's always carryover money. There's always money at the end of the fiscal year you watch. And believe me, the department heads rely on it to help balance their budget the next year. And then the money, in many cases, is in silos. So you can't use transportation money for uh, parks. You can't use parks money to site the jail because it's in silos. It can be used for only specific purposes because let's face it, every constituency wants their piece of the action. Okay? So that's the reason. Yes? Up in the back. 
Yes, um, there's two issues that I think are very important to have stable uh, economics. One is the um, retirement pension funds need to be fully funded because otherwise you're simply passing the buck on to the next generation to deal with it. The other issue is in terms of investments, investment houses, where you pay the, um, the um, broker, you pay him a commission. Well, that, he or she will, will try to sell you or the county or the city whatever makes him the largest um, commission. And it should be what's the best investment for the community. Absolutely right, that's my point, is that didn't happen during the Orange County bankruptcy. And frankly, these people that got these big fees, and I'm not picking on Merrill Lynch because there were all sorts, of, all sorts of folks that got nailed with settlements, millions of dollars, because of doing exactly what you said. Right down here. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Steiner, I recently had a so-called vacation in Florida where I have family and I noticed the tremendous boom going on in Florida. Housing, businesses, young people moving in by the hundreds of thousands, no state income tax, right. a lower sales tax, I can keep on going. And I come back to California and I see the exact opposite mm -hmm. around here. Malls closing, young people can't afford homes. I recall when we were younger, suburbs had thousands of children and bicycles. You go around suburbia today, you see more damn dogs than you see children. And uh, I'm just wondering, what is the future for the younger generation here in Orange County and in Florida, as this seems to be, this trend seems to be accelerating? Well, it is, and it is, and it's really tough for me, because my wife and I were so happy that of our five children, four of them live within four miles, four blocks, live in Corona, live in South County, live in Orange, and one got away, our youngest daughter. She got to Arizona with her husband, Marcy. Mar and guess what? They love it over there. You know why? Because their tax burden is less. Their house costs less. They've got good schools in Chandler, Arizona. They've got good friends, and they can put up with the heat over there for five months. And so all of a sudden I go, wow, were we lucky to keep four, and I can get over to Arizona. In fact, I'm going over the 13th of February for four days to, for my granddaughter's 16th birthday. So weren't we lucky, but guess what's happening to my grandkids? They're moving. One's in Modesto teaching fourth grade because it's cheaper to live in Modesto. I don't want to live in Modesto, but she loves it and her husband loves it. One is working 28 years old in New Zealand, for God's sake. I said, Sarah, what, you, can you find a nice little New Zealand boy over there? <laughs> grandpa, grandpa, grandpa. And one's, one, he's a firefighter, a paramedic. He lives in North Las Vegas. He says, Grandpa, I know it's not the strip, but man, is it really interesting to be in North Las Vegas. We get so many calls, and the Raiders are moving here. I guess that's the viewpoint of a firefighter paramedic. Um, I've got a granddaughter who's in at, at Texas A&M. She's going to get her dietitian stuff. All of a sudden, these grandkids of mine, they're, they're, they're dispersing. They, none of them, none of them can afford, and they got nine are graduated from college. They can't afford to buy a house. Not only that, they're paying over $2,000 a month for rent. And guess what? If the corporations and the regular folks leave California, then the goose that laid the golden egg for California to pay for all the stuff that you want to pay for in California, it's going to diminish that. And then what happens? I don't know. But you, it's totally legitimate. And I've got other friends, they, oh, do we love Tennessee? Bill, do we love Tennessee? Oh, I'm going to Coeur d'Alene. I'm going to Prescott. I mean, wait a minute. Uh, you know, I'm going to go to Saddleback Chapel. You know, for my celebration of life, that's it. I'm not going anywhere. But a lot of young people nowadays go, 
Where am I going to live? It's too expensive to live in California. All right. Well, let's just give a big round of applause. Our time's come to an end. Mr. Steiner, we really appreciate your sharing your thoughts, your insights. Um, thank you, each of you, for coming out. Let me uh, mention that next week we have Dr. Joanna Roche talking about ornamentation versus abstraction on graphic design. Totally different topic. Come out. You're going to really love it. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.